and do a brief overview of metallic bonds. So metallic bonds simply be form, form between metal atoms. So every atom in the sample is a metal. And, and so just think like a great example of metallic bonds would be what holds all the aluminum atoms together in aluminum foil. Because we all have probably used aluminum foil. So that aluminum foil, its chemical formula is simply Al, but when you pull out that sheet of aluminum foil, you understand it's not one atom, but it's trillions and trillions of atoms. And they stay linked together because of the metallic bonds. Now, these metallic bonds that hold like all the aluminum atoms together in aluminum foil, they are described as a mobile sea, like an ocean sea of valence electrons. So a little bit of terminology we haven't seen in a while. The valence electrons freely move among the kernels of the atoms in the sample. So for my illustration, I'm going to use the element sodium. So sodium. So an atom of sodium, if this circle represents its nucleus, there are 11 protons and probably 12 neutrons. Sodium's electrons in ground state, they occupy the first three energy levels. So sodium has two electrons in energy level one, eight electrons in energy level two, and one electron in energy level three. So energy level three represents the valence shell. So that means my sodium dot diagram would get one electron. So that right there and that guy there, that represents the valence. Everything else that is not the valence, so everything else in the atom, the nucleus and the inner occupied non-valence electrons, that is what we refer to as the kernel. And in the dot diagram, the Na, the element symbol, represents the kernel. So when you take a look at this diagram, all of these circles here, they're not the individual nucleus, but it's the kernel. The nucleus plus all inner val valent or inner electron shells that are used but are not the valence. Right? So here we go. These are all those, the kernel part of the aluminum sheet. And then when you notice here, you see like a little minus sign and you see this dot and then it has this arrow of it traveling around. All of these are the trying to show the mobile movement of those valence electrons. And they just zoom around in the sample, right? Swimming around all of those kernels. So knowing your terminology. That's what we need to know about metallic bonds. Now the other thing I'm gonna tell you is because of these mobile valence electrons, this is what provides metals with some of their unique characteristics, okay? So this is what makes metals have luster or being shiny. So they're, they have luster, they're shiny because the moving electrons reflect light. This is why metals are malleable and ductile that we can shape them with a hammer to flatten or form. We can pull them into a wire because every time, whenever you manipulate the structure, the kernels are forced to move. 
two kernels, both being positive, will push away, but the valence electrons slip in between to prevent positive to positive repulsion and shattering of the metal lattice. And then lastly, this is the reason that they conduct electricity. So moving charges is electricity. So they have these mobile or moving valence electrons. So the key reason we associate these characteristics with the average metal is because of that mobile C of valence electrons. Let's take a look at a couple of practice questions. Typical practice questions. So here we go. So my first question says, which formula represents an ionic compound? So when I think ionic, right away, I think I probably need a metal versus a nonmetal. So when I, take a, when I take a look here, both atoms are hydrogen. So it's nonmetal, nonmetal. It doesn't have a metal. CH4, carbon's a nonmetal. H is a nonmetal, so everything's a nonmetal. I see C, I see carbon in this next one, nonmetal. I see H a nonmetal, and oxygen's a nonmetal. All are nonmetals, definitely not ionic. And then letter D, I see Ca, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a nonmetal. So my best choice here is letter D. So take a look here. Next question. The bond between hydrogen and oxygen is classified as. Well, I like to break it down. So I see first the bond types, covalent and ionic. So I know that if it's a metal plus a nonmetal, that's ionic. If it's nonmetal plus nonmetal, then I know it's covalent. So I'm going to get it down to a 50 50. Hydrogen is a nonmetal, and oxygen is a nonmetal. So that means that the bond I expect to be, be present is a covalent. So I can get rid of B and D because they say ionic. Now, the polar part it is the END. So if my END, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's 0.4 or less, it's nonpolar. It's going to be polar, it's 0.5 and plus. So if it's less than 4, 0.4, nonpolar, greater than that. So that means I have to look them up. So hydrogen is 2.2, oxygen is 3.4. So the difference between them, so my END here equals 1.2, which is greater than 0.5. So that means that it is a, it's covalent because it's nonmetal plus nonmetal, and it's polar because the END is greater than 0.4. So the electrons in a bond between two iodine atoms are shared. How are they shared? Well, I see that in my four responses, it has a term equally, unequally, polar, and nonpolar. So nonpolar means equal, polar means unequal. So take a look. I have nonpolar here. It says unequally. I'm going to eliminate that because that's a wrong match. Nonpolar equal. That statement is okay. Um, here I have polar. Polar has to be unequal, so C is okay. D, where it says polar and equally, that wording can't be there. So I went from four possible choices with knowing some major ideas and got it down to a 50-50. Well, if we're talking about bond polarity, you have to look at the END. So if it's, if it's a polar bond, that means the END is going to be greater than 0.4, and if it's nonpolar, the END is going to be less than that 0.5, right? Well, iodine and iodine, it's the same type. Do I even have to look up its electronegativity? 
No, because I know one, the iodines have the same EN, so the END here is zero, so zero difference. So B is my best. It's definitely nonpolar. So you go ahead. Oh, let's look at a couple more questions. Uh, question four, which, which compound contains both ionic and covalent? Our big key here is it must contain a poly ion, something from our reference table E. So here, no poly, no poly, no poly. What we see in parentheses, that is my example of a poly, so D is the best answer. Now, number five, this is really important. It says which bond has the most ionic character. Now, it says character, so it doesn't mean that it's an ionic bond, but it has, it has a greater character like it. So when you see most ionic character, that means you want the one with the biggest END. The larger the, the END, the less sharing. So you have to simply calculate the differences in the ENDs. So nitrogen and hydrogen, their END is 0 0.8. Two fluorines, the END is 0. Between bromine and chlorine, when you look them up and calculate the difference, it's 0 0.2. And carbon and hydrogen, their calculated END is 0.4. Four. So the one that is, has the greatest ionic character because the biggest END means it has the least amount of sharing would be response A. Question six would be kind of the opposite process. So it has which one is the least polar, which means it has the smaller END, meaning there is more sharing. Once again, calculate the ENDs. So when you look up hydrogen and fluorines and calculate their difference, it's 1.8. Between hydrogen and chlorine, the difference is 1.0. Between hydrogen and bromine, 0 0.8. And between hydrogen and iodine, it is 0 0.5. So the one that is the least polar, most sharing, has the smallest electronegativity difference.